Our next presentation is uh, by Thomas Walsh from Cornell University, and it's modeling invasive aspergillosis, how close are predicted antifungal targets. Buonasera. <clears throat> oh, good afternoon. Um, I'm just trying to orient myself. Ah, here's something. Um, today we will be discussing, uh, as my assigned topic, modeling invasive aspergillosis and how close are predicted antifungal targets. Um, to address this question, I think it's helpful to have some background. And the background would basically be that of that animal models are a critical component of the process of discovery and development of new antifungal agents for treatment and prevention of acute invasive aspergillosis. Um, several models in murine, rats, guinea pigs, and rabbits have been developed and studied for development of new antifungal agents in treatment of IA. Um, we'll, we will review these markers using these systems and their predictability in clinical trials with a focus on acute invasive aspergillosis, as there are many challenges that remain to develop systems for chronic invasive pulmonary aspergillosis. And we will also focus just on pulmonary aspergillosis. While there are many challenges with disseminated and CNS aspergillosis, um, the tractable and greatest body of data really reside uh, with that of invasive pulmonary aspergillosis. So for our objectives today, we'll review the markers used in laboratory systems in development of new antifungal agents, assess the predictability of these markers for predicting outcome in clinical trials, and then identify the unmet needs, new directions for markers in preclinical and clinical trials. So we'll begin, and I'm going to focus most of our attention on our persistently neutropenic rabbit model of acute invasive pulmonary aspergillosis as a paradigm for how biomarkers, um, phenotypic and, uh, and otherwise, may be used to be able to define and predict clinical trial outcome. So the persistently neutropenic rabbit model of invasive pulmonary aspergillosis has been a highly predictive system in identifying new antifungal agents for treatment and prevention of this frequently lethal infection. Uh, just by way of methodology, <clears throat> the system begins with a central silastic venous catheter, allowing for atraumatic venous access, which is essential for administering multiple compounds, assessing multiple biomarkers in the course of clinical, uh, in the clinical observation, uh, as well as being able to characterize pharmacokinetics and pharmacodynamics um, in, in individual animals. It also improves quality uh, insofar as that there is no trauma suffered to the animal while they're conscious and having blood draws in contrast to many of our other smaller animal systems, which when they have blood drawn can be traumatic. We use ARIC induction as no drug-drug interaction for profound persistent neutropenia, but we can further simulate a cell-mediated immune suppression uh, with cyclosporin and or methylprednisolone. Uh, we, in this setting of intense immunosuppression, provide very intensive supportive care with at least twice daily monitoring, 24-7 on-call schedule, and antibacterial prophylaxis. Now, our approach in translational research for invasive fungal infections is one that really starts at the bedside where we see the unmet needs as one, novel antimicrobial compounds that are needed, two, a strategy for augmentation of host defense, and three, a need for early diagnosis, biomarkers, and therapeutic monitoring. Uh, e each of those constitutes a pillar of our laboratory when we are addressing these, uh, these concerns and questions, and we'll go through in vitro uh, systems, interpredictive animal model systems, phase one, phase two, and phase three clinical trials. In our animal model systems, we incorporate as much as possible the development of biomarkers and therapeutic monitoring. So what are the basic methodologies, characteristic of the model? Um, we have direct endotracheal inoculation for, with a carefully quantified in, uh, inoculum under general anesthesia, colonization of the tracheobronchial tree. As immune suppression progresses, colonization progresses, as we, as we would see in our patients, to a, a time-dependent uh, colonization from progression to nodular and segmental pneumonia, and finally, 
prompting then what we call the trigger to treat justification initiation of therapy within 24 hours in a duration of study of 12 to 14. We know by CT, we've also done chest radiographs, but CT, as you would expect, would be far more sensitive. We know at the time of that, from that time of inoculation, of colonization going into immunosuppression, that we begin to see, as you can see in the top panel, panel A, the emergence of pulmonary infiltrates. It will be at that point that one clinically would then initiate antifungal therapy. And therefore, it is not an arbitrary time point, but it is one that is grounded in radiological manifestations. Of note, these infiltrates that we observe on CT scan are also radiologically compatible with those that we see in our patients, meaning nodules, wedge-shaped infiltrates, and halo signs. So <clears throat> if one asks what has been the impact of markers of therapeutic response in this model system, since its initial development, we've used a wide range of complementary therapeutic responses that have given us insight into dosages, drug disposition, safety, tolerability, and efficacy that have then led, de-risked, and predicted the clinical trials for these antifungal agents that you see here, including the lipid formulation of amph amphotericin B formulations, a wide range of the major echinocandins, and the antifungal mold active triazoles, Vori, POSA, ISAVU, and more recently, uh, the oral uh, and to ultimately IV agent, Ebrexifunger. If we then look at the first attempt at establishing the system and utilizing this panel of markers, um, we basically can look at the first model for, that we employed for in the persistently neutropenic rabbit model, looking at the potential role for galactomannan as a marker of infection. To our knowledge, this was the first time that galactomannan had been used in a model system for invasive pulmonary aspergillosis for not only for detection, but also for therapeutic monitoring. So using humanized dosing, using liposomal amphotericin B with a comparator of one milligram per kilogram of deoxycholate, we found liposomal amphotericin B was more effective uh, less nephrotoxic, and the outcome markers showed increased survival, reduced number of viable organisms, and decreased tissue injury to aspergillus organisms, as well as the prevention of nephrotoxicity. It's important to incorporate the toxicity into the into assessment of antifungal agents because a con significant contributor to mortality can be that of the toxic of the toxicity of the agent as well. Moreover, when we think about how patients perish from invasive aspergillosis. It is really related to organism-mediated pulmonary injury, of, especially in the acute setting, the neutropenic setting of hemorrhage, necrosis, and infarction, and loss of viable pulmonary tissue. With that, then, we could ask ourselves, how well is this predictive? If we look at the AMBELO trial, uh, organized and spearheaded by Dr. Cornelli, Oliver Cornelli, in a double-blind randomized trial where patients were randomized to either 3 milligram per kilogram or 10 milligram per kilogram, you might anticipate that there was very good activity of the 3 milligram per kilogram, given that we saw excellent activity at the 5, and indeed, Overall survival rate at 12 weeks of ambisome was 72%, uh, at least as good, if not better, than the earlier reported voriconazole study, and overall response rate was 50%. You may ask the question, and this relates to biomarkers, this relates to the markers of therapeutic response, why is it in the clinical trial that we're seeing survival 72% and then response rate 50%? Um, there, it, it relates ultimately to the global response criteria that are used, where CT scan is used as a pivotal criterion. And what we see experimentally, and what we see clinically, is that though there may be significant improvement in response, the infiltrates of CT scan can still persist, leading then to the conclusion of either stable or potentially uh, not sufficiently resolved that then the patient is said not to be success. We know from our own experience, from my chairing data review committees, as well as examining our own clinical trial data, that we see that patients may have a full galactomannan resolution, complete resolution of other symptoms and signs, have a Karnowski score that is 100%, still have pulmonary infiltrates, yet then be called a failure. So there is then, as we talk about markers of response, there is then a critical need to reassess the pivotal role of CT scan, and as I will emphasize through this lecture, 
the need for incorporating the more sensitive biomarkers, such as uh, ser serial serum galactomannan, as a biomarker for therapeutic response. So if we look at the pharmacodynamics, <clears throat> we can see that the model system further underscores the power and predictability in terms of dosing. Um, <clears throat> in collaboration with Dr. Hope, from, who was with our laboratory and now has uh, flourished at, um, in Liverpool, we studied the pharmacokinetics and P PKPD of all the lipid formulations of amphotericin B and deoxycholate amphotericin B <clears throat> and found that near maximal antifungal activity was found at the three to five milligram per kilogram as demarcated by resolution, virtually complete resolution of galactomannan and 1,3-beta-D-glucan within that dosage. And that dosage in the large amyloid clinical trial was right at the three milligram per kilogram. Our animal systems predicted the three milligram per kilogram in a robust manner using galactomannan 1,3-beta-D-glucan. So all formulations induce a dose-dependent reduction in lung injury, and a clinical dosage of liposomal amphotericin B ambisome was predicted to have a maximal suppression of 1,3-beta-D-glucan and galactomannan. Now, let's switch then, those are lipid formulations. Let's switch then to antifungal triazoles. What can we learn in terms of biomarkers, in terms of treatment and prevention? If we then look at our a study, a very intensive study of the antifungal activity and pharmacokinetics of posaconazole in treatment and prevention of experimental invasive aspergillosis, we find a striking correlation with galactomannan and antigenemia. <clears throat> the antifungal therapy in this model consisted of humanized doses of 2, 6, and 20 milligram per kilogram um, by mouth. Itraconazole also at 2, 6, and 20 milligram per kilogram using the cyclodextrin formulation to ensure bioavailability and as a standard uh, control, one milligram per kilogram deoxycholate ampho. So if we look at the panel of markers, in vivo markers, we see survival of <clears throat> the two higher doses of posaconazole significantly greater than what we would other otherwise uh, saw with deoxycholate and the lower dose. We see significant reductions and the pulmonary infarct score to the right, and further down on the bottom, correlating with that, virtual normalization of the total lung weight, and then virtual complete resolution of the log CFU per gram in these humanized therapeutic doses. When we look to galactomannan and 1,3-beta-D-glucan, we once again can see those two dosages of posaconazole completely normalize those biomarkers. And then if we look to CT scan, where we do volumetric imaging, and serial CT scanning, we can see that at the, at, with posaconazole, there's significant lowering uh, of, <clears throat> with, uh, in comparison to the untreated controls. But notice, though, it, doesn't, it, it starts at the baseline of what was the pulmonary infiltrate. So we know at 24 hours that there were pulmonary infiltrates. We know that at the end of therapy, there were pulmonary infiltrates. So you could not necessarily say this was complete eradication. And therein lies the concern that you have organism-mediated pulmonary injury that is not necessarily going to be completely eradicated or completely normalized as purely a function of antifungal therapy. Again, the caveat of using CT scan as the ultimate arbiter in determining clinical outcome in, in therapeutic trials. From the standpoint of day-to-day -day clinical care, yes, we use the CT scan commonly, but when one is deciding antifungal therapy and response in a clinical trial, it is a less sensitive tool. And then if we ask ourselves, well, was the system able to predict human pharmacology? And we saw strikingly that we were able to clamp those concentrations at, comparable to each other of ITRA and POSA, very similar to what we see in our patients in, uh, in, in clinical trials and in clinical care. So we then ask ourselves, was this predictive? Did it help define the clinical trial? Did it help us uh, anticipate what the, our clinical trial was? So we then evaluate it in a large, salvage study um, of treatment of invasive aspergillosis with posaconazole in patients who are refractory to or intolerant of conventional therapy. Um, 
this was a, an extensive multi-center study with many esteemed and outstanding colleagues, experts in invasive aspergillosis and other mycosis, where we studied the efficacy and safety of posaconazole, 800 milligram per day in divided doses, and an open-label multi-center study. And what we saw using global response by salvage therapy, an overall success rate, DRC defined, 42%, that included CT scan, 26% for the control subjects, with significant differences in, what, in, in anticipation then of what we would have seen or what we did see in, our, in the laboratory study. Again, superiority over the standard of care with posaconazole. And if we evaluate those external controls with AMFO-B, itraconazole, AMFO-B, and itra, at, at that time there was no VORI approved, um, we saw again consistent superiority in each of the subgroups. If we then look further um, to, the, uh, to overall survival, we again saw on the postconazole treated patients compared to the external control group, significant improvement of survival, again predicted from the, our laboratory animal model system. Further predictive and the predictive power of using that, that kind of system and the power of animal models to help define outcome we further evaluated the impact of serum concentrations of posaconazole on outcome. And if you look at the lower line in the fourth quartile of subjects at 16, where you have a mean of 1,480 nanogram per ml, we had the highest response rates of 75%. This has held up consistently over the course of time from the rabbit models to the salvage study, and then very, very robust clinical observations, observational studies showing the correlation of a dose-dependent therapeutic response to, of posaconazole in treatment or prevention of invasive aspergillosis. If we then go to the next question uh, of posaconazole and its role in prophylaxis in patients with neutropenia, we see <clears throat> from the New, England, the New England Journal study, that there was significant improvement in patients who were randomized to posaconazole versus fluconazole or itraconazole as standard of care. Um, one of the key authors of this paper um, was that of uh, Dr. Cornelli and also Dr. David Angula, who's with us today as well. We, in, in evaluating these patients in a double-blinded manner became very apparent that posaconazole, <clears throat> once the blind was broken, was robustly preventing infection. And that, again, has become standard of care that was predicted by the animal model system. Another area of critical importance is that of combination antifungal therapy. And there have been extensive studies in that regard. But taking a targeted approach, we've addressed this question over the course of a decade and have conducted three major preclinical studies with different compounds, with the central theme being that of mold-active antifungal triazole and echinocandin, with the hypothesis that with the simultaneous disruption of cell wall and cell membrane biosynthesis in aspergillus, that there may be an additive to synergistic effect. And indeed, these systems consistently, as targeted therapy, have predicted that. And the, we'll use as an example, though, that of voriconazole and anidula fungin. So here, this is a panel that I've introduced to you previously, where you have cumulative survival probability, infarct score, lung weight, pulmonary fungal burden, the red arrows pointing to the combination of anidula fungin, voriconazole, as improving survival reduction of organism-mediated pulmonary injury and infarcts and lung weight, and uh, residual fungal burden. That translates then into reduction into the CT volume, uh, where we see pulmonary infiltrates resolving clinically, and it also correlated well with the, re with the simultaneous reduction of galactomannan uh, that you see to the left in serum, as well as BAL, galactomannan, and BAL DNA by PCR. How do the how does that relate in, in vitro? In, in studying this in vitro, what I'm showing you now is that of a bliss surface modeling system where you have voriconazole to the left, anidula fungin. And instead of a, a simple FIC index where you draw individual lines and where there is potential observer bias, the algorithms allow for totally independent assessment and predictability of every well. And the direction of the overall surface in the positive direction, upward directions, indicates synergy. 
and a drop below indicates antagonism, and you can see through the wide range of concentrations of vorian and nidula fungin, significant, <coughs> significant increase overall indicating synergy. Well, how does this relate, and how did it predict the outcome for the clinical trial? Um, in the randomized trial of anidula fungin plus voriconazole versus voriconazole alone, we saw in a study that <coughs> perhaps may not have been as robustly powered as, as needed, but nonetheless showed mortality rates at, uh, at six weeks at 19 versus 27.5%. It was a p-value of 0.087. But the multiple variable regression analysis suggested that the maximum galactomian and value also had prognoc prognostic significance. That then led to a post-talk analysis of simply asking, at six-week six mortality, what did we see? And those patients that were galactomian and positive, not all patients had galactomian and for assessment, but amongst those who did have serum galactomian and available serially, it was evident that, that patients on combination therapy fared better, had lower mortality than that of those on monotherapy, meaning approximately 16% on combination therapy and 27% on monotherapy with the result of a p-value of 0 0.04. So I've discussed with you examples of how we can use these markers in the rabbit model. I'm going to just close now with just other examples going to, for example, the murine model where, for example, from Dr. David Andy's laboratory, where one can use a PKPD approach to be able to identify the point at which one has a significant reduction in stasis at one log, where one is looking at free drug concentration in a series of, of mice that are treated, and then evaluating and modeling using the sigmoidal Emax response relationship and the Hill equation to identify at what AUC, and hence dosage, uh, would one see stasis at one log reduction. Um, in another system that is uh, used by Dr. Patterson at University of Texas at San Antonio, one can use survival, uh, as seen in the guinea pigs as well, but there are also biomarkers in that system as well that prove to be predictive, and as well as the log CFU per gram, um, the, as well as 1,3-beta-D-glucan, uh, 18S ribosomal uh, DNA from, from lung tissue, and galactomannan. So if we look at our future directions, there is a critical need for implementation of biomarkers from preclinical data into end, end clinical endpoint criteria. There is enormous amount of information that is proven to be predictive, and bringing some of the biomarker data that we know, particularly galactomannan response, is really paramount for the success of future and predictability of future trials. Um, we, there's a need also for development of new models of chronic and endobronchial aspergillosis. The data that I showed you is largely from inv acute invasive pulmonary aspergillosis. Um, we and others have developed an endobronchial system, but those need to be more robustly studied as the challenge of chronic pulmonary aspergillosis really remains very elusive. And then uh, we have, uh, there's a need for systematic integration of data from several models predicting outcome. One can simply not use a murine model and go to clinical trial or draw conclusions. There's a critical need for complementary model systems such as murine, rat, uh, rabbits, murine, guinea pig rabbits, so that one can see that there is consistency and, be, and if there are inconsistencies, resolve those before going into clinical trial and putting our patients at risk potentially for poor outcome or toxicity. So in summary, the decision to move from laboratory to clinical trial should be predicated upon a portfolio of complementary and mutually validating preclinical laboratory animal models and meticulous preclinical investigation of a candidate antifungal compound in a robust series of predicted systems will optimize study design, de-risk the clinical trials, and ensure tangible benefit to our most vulnerable immunocompromised patients with acute invasive aspergillosis. I just want to acknowledge my uh, tremendous colleagues and friends uh, at Weill Cornell uh, and collaborations nationally and internationally, uh, our the many funding and support agencies that we have, as well as very critically, uh, the industrial collaborations and their foresight in bringing new compounds to trial. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, do we have questions?
Thank you for a very informative talk. Uh, I was wondering, the two-part question, the, the insensitivity of CT scanning, is, is, would you think that's just radiographic lag as we see in the clinic? And has anyone taken the CT scan out further to see if actually you see the nodules changing over a longer period of so time? So there's no doubt that CT scan, when followed out over a long period of time, gradually resolves. It's very much dependent upon host, and it very much really depends upon the host response. If you take at one stage the acute invasive pulmonary aspergillosis, you have angioinvasion, hemorrhage, and infarction. So even after you've eradicated the organism and the edema surrounding that uh, and the ischemia starts radiographically improving as you kill off organisms, there still remains infarction. And that over time can resolve either to a thin-walled cavity that collapses on itself or some scarring. But in the corticosteroid-treated hosts, if we start breaking them down, such as GVHD corticosteroid in that population versus acute neutropenia, the infiltrates can take much longer. There, there's not as much angioinvasion. Um, there is much more of a segmental bronchopneumonia, a necrotizing process, and that can take longer but can resolve. What you find in the primary immune deficiencies, um, our, our colleague from, uh, from Israel who was uh, discussing may find this interesting as well, that, the new, that probably because of the intensity of the neutrophils and the potential lack of apoptosis, we've, uh, that there can be long persistence of, of infiltrates. That even when you have children that graduate from high school and have resolved and you take a CT scan, that you can still see evidence of infiltrates. So, so much of that really depends upon the host factors as well. I, and I guess my second question is, what about like PET scan? So pet, we've been using PET scan um, in the lung and in bone uh, to measure viability. Thus far, we've seen in bone that there is a nice correlation. We're still exploring it uh, in the lung, but in principle, that might be helpful. It might be helpful. Thank you. The, uh, very nice presentation. The okay. synergy that you see between echinocannons and azoles is very encouraging. But for, you know, the more chronic, um, non-invasive uh, aspergillosis syndromes like allergic bronchopulmonary aspergillosis, I think we really need similar synergistic uh, uh, approaches, uh, but we can't use intravenous drugs. It's just not possible for obvious reasons. So I'm wondering if you've ever looked at um, other possible synergistic combinations, but involving oral agents. So uh, one, one area that I think holds tremendous promise, uh, and this is for aspergillus, I'll hasten to add that we do not see the echinocandin mold active triazole, unfortunately, in fusarium, for example. But if we, if we were to look fo purely and focus solely on aspergillosis, just um, experimentally, what we find is very encouraging, and I did not mention it here because it's just waiting for final approval from the journal before it's finally accepted, that we've looked also at the mold at, at basically the echinocandin oral equivalent of uh, SCYO78 or a Brexifunger. And it is perhaps almost now 40 years uh, since uh, LY121019, what Silofungin was originally discovered by Eli Lilly, and then that was put aside for a variety of reasons, that we have long been looking for the oral cell wall active agent, purely cell wall that is hitting the 1,3-beta-D-glucan target, albeit in a slightly different way. And we've had the um, privilege and honor of working closely uh, with our colleagues at Synexis and have seen very promising activity, very encouraging activity of SCY078, of Brexifunger, um, plus a mold active triazol in treatment of invasive aspergillosis. Uh, there is now an open, based on those observations and other complementary um, studies from our colleagues, there's now an open trial for, uh, for, as for invasive aspergillosis. The question on allergic bronchopulmonary aspergillosis and endobronchial asper aspergillosis uh, is tantalizing because there it's, it's a situation where we're not measuring, if you will, in weeks, but months in terms of response. And it's an area that really cries out for, for, for further study. I'm delighted that you're going to be working on chronic pulmonary aspergillosis with colleagues. That's fantastic, Tom. Um, we see clinically a major problem with the development of resistance. And it occurs over months or years. So I know that yep. rabbits live longer than mice, but... Uh, all right, sorry. Uh, uh, I know that rabbits live longer than mice, but 
maintaining a laboratory experiment for months is not no. No. doable, I don't think, not really, anyway. So no. do you think there are limits to the preclinical studies related to the emergence of resistance, which is what I'm really getting at, as opposed to the primary PKPD pieces and the tissue injury and toxicity issues? So for the, it, I th it's a very important question, David, and so we've looked at resistance in, in two ways from the standpoint of organisms that are intrinsically resistant. Uh, Aspergillus terius, for example, predicted easily that that organism was going to be highly resistant to ampho B. Uh, the critical question of how to manage uh, many of the uh, triazole, voriconazole resistant aspergillus fumigati that are coming about um, will lend itself very nicely in the acute invasive pulmonary model. For the chronic, I think there are two questions then. How do we measure the emergence of resistance and can we at least assess some degree of response in an endobronchial infection? For the emergence of resistance, it's, it, you're absolutely right. It will take um, months to, to years, potentially, to be able to monitor that. Um, outside of the realm of mycology, we have a parallel effort in, um, in multidrug resistant bacteria, where we have organisms that have just one susceptibility to one agent, and you can't afford to lose those. And measuring these systems going out 14 days are tremendously powerful compared to mice that live 24, 48 hours, and being able to pick up the emergence of resistance that may take place. But there you're looking at um, a major order of magnitude difference in time. Those systems will pick up resistance within that 14-day period but we have never seen the emergence of resistance in a 14, even one month. Our chronic aspergillosis model goes out for, 14, for, uh, for, for one month. It probably could go out longer, but we scale it for one month. We've never seen emergence of resistance, but it's a very different disease. Uh, understanding endobronchial disease, I think, is critical at a preclinical level. How do we get drug in? ELF is not necessarily predictive because you're way down in the bronchus, and when you're looking at a segmental bronchus, it may not have anything to do with what's in the alveolus. So at least the preclinical model systems will help us understanding drug penetration, drug activity in an endobronchial delivery system, or if we give it aerosolized, that lends itself very nicely. But the emergence of resistance uh, will probably have to take place clinically, uh, measured out over months. Tom, hi. Um, hi. Two short questions, if I may. As you know, um, the majority of the patients that we enroll in clinical studies have probable disease, and that's defined on the basis of positive BAL galactomenon, not necessarily serum galactomenon. So if you want to design our clinical studies that use serum galactomenon as, a, as an outcome measure, does that mean that we have to design studies for, CM, for seropositive patients on the one hand and for seronegative patients on the other hand? It's a good, very, very important question. I would, ask, I would just ask one, one question. Of the patients that have bronchovilar vas galactomannan and your wonderfully vast experience, um, what percentage has a positive serum galactomannan? In our hands, in the hematology population, it's around 30 to 35 percent. Okay, so, so in that regard, it, it narrows it down. Um, so you could say already there that you'd, if you were going to use serum galactoman as a marker, we obviously would lose two-thirds of the patients. Um, that, that certainly is um, obviously not ideal because our enrollment criteria already are removing so many of the potentially uh, treatable uh, po patients. So on the one hand, one could design a study exclusively for that, and there, there, is, there are studies out there now that are ongoing uh, for the serum galactomannan. But I would raise a question, borrowing again from our bacteriology colleagues of how they study ventilator-associated pneumonia. Um, they think nothing of going back and performing a repeat bronchovial lavage, particularly in the setting of a clinical trial, documenting the reduction. And there we're using, and we contribute to those studies both preclinically and clinically, there um, it's one is looking at significant bioreduction. So if you have 10 to the fifth um, uh, colony forming units of a multidrug resistant Pseudomonas aeruginosa, you're looking for significant reduction, usually three logs, and that has prognostic significance. So I would raise the question, is it, what are your thoughts potentially of explaining to patients that 
you know, we, this is a clinical trial, we have a new a antifungal agent, and we would like to perform two bronchovilovage, a baseline and an end of therapy, to document that we've resolved it. Well, well, I think one of the problems is that if you look at, at serum galactomin, and we have sufficient data to show that, that, there is, that the kinetics of serum galactomin correlate with the outcome, and I'm not sure that we have those data that are strong enough to suggest that for BL, uh, lava, for BL fluid as well. So that would be part one, that, that we investigate that first. And then you can start incorporating it in clinical decision-making and also in clinical studies. Mm -hmm. I think that the data is strong enough for, for serum galactomannan, mm -hmm. but not for BL galactomannan. But that brings me immediately to my second question, even for serum galactomannan, um, is there a minimum duration that you want to respect of, 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 of seronegativity? I mean, if the patients become oh. GM seronegative, are you bold enough to stop the antifungal treatment? Or do you say, well, you need to be at least two weeks or three weeks seronegative before we so, stop? So this is uh, in clinical practice or, or clinical trial design? Both. I mean, once we will study it in, in, clinical, in clinical trial design, and then we go to clinical practice, I guess, or vice versa. Right? So if we, if, we look to, if we look to clinical trial design, uh, one, uh, certainly what we, what we need fundamentally are the phase, are phase two studies that define. And that, the, one of that, those studies actually with, that I mentioned already, with voriconazole and uh, brexafungerp is ongoing. And there we have uh, identified just multiple variations addressing those themes. Specifically, and we, we really don't have that solid of a body of, of information. What happens at, if serum galactamine is negative at end of therapy? What happens if it's still negative and how far out does it stay negative? From what we've seen clinically, um, if the serum galactamine has resolved, you know, i.e. less than 0 0.5, and there has been either recovery from neutropenia or the patient remains, uh, is remaining neutropenic but is otherwise stable and pulmonary infiltrates are resolving. We've not seen, once they've gone out to six weeks, any recurrence. The danger becomes that if they have recovered and then they undergo, as you know, another cycle, there is the, clearly the potential for reactivation. But there, once again, they're looking, you're looking at a small amount of canidia, probably hypho elements that are still in the endobronchial tissue or in deep tissue that's then going to start reemerging. It's a different situation, but at least from what we've seen also in the isavuconazole trial, and William had modeled this very nicely, um, based on, the, uh, on, on those data, that a serum galactomannan and trending downward um, by day seven carried significant, uh, very significant probability of complete resolution. So I think there are trends in the markers um, that would reassure us that once you, and we see this in the animal systems, we see it practically in our patients, we have it from the isavuconazole data, that once you get to a certain threshold of galactomannan, either trending downward or normalization, um, you probably are going to do well, um, especially if you recover from neutropenia.